up YouTube fam? This your girl Mrs. Tony Two Times and we back with another video. Let's hear from tonight's sponsor and then we'll jump right into it. This video is brought to you by Cool Green Clothing. Cool Green Clothing is a Baltimore-based clothing line that started back in 2018 and has been growing strong ever since. Make sure you follow Cool Green Clothing on Facebook and IG at Cool Green Clothing and check out their website, coolgreenclothing.com, where you can find the latest Cool Green fashions and hats, women's apparel, and the latest men's collection. Remember, if you ain't coolin' and get in the green, you in the way. Ralph Lauren, name What's is Brandon. It's up. That's What's what I did myself. What's up? My name is AC Brandon. What's up? If I What's turn up? AC to cool, you got a cool brain. Mm -hmm. And if you ain't cool and get in the green, you in the way. That's just basic. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Gang, gang. So, yeah. Hey, the cool green is the shit. <laughs> the cool green is, if you don't get no other authentic t shirt, come down here to my man and represent for the brother Cool Green Clothing. <laughs> That's C O O L. G R E E N clothing line. That's why I spell it out for The man. best, the best clothing line you could ever, ever get, bro. The <laughs> best clothing line. The good, cool green. Man, how you hear about us? Been through the good video with man Tony two times. <laughs> all the way from Annapolis to support cool green. My man come down all the way from Annapolis, man. That's love. Welcome back, fam. If you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, I invite you to join the Two Times fam. Tap that subscribe button, hit the notification bell to get notified of okay. all uploads. Be sure to like this video if you're rocking with the content. Comment down below and share your thoughts. Of course, always keeping it respectful. Share this video with everyone you know. Make sure you watch till the end to get the full context of the story. As you can see, this is going to be lengthy, so let's get right into it. Miss Jacqueline Smith was born July 4th, 1964 in Providence, Rhode Island. Jacqueline came from a big family. She attended the prestigious Classical High School in Rhode Island and went on to major in engineering at North Carolina A&T State University. She met her first husband there and they had two sons together. He was in the army and the couple moved to different places, including Germany. Later, Jacqueline moved to the Maryland area with her two sons who graduated from high school there. In 2018, at the age of 54, she lived on the 4900 block of Villa Point Drive in Aberdeen, Maryland with her second husband of four years, Keith Smith, and worked as an electrical engineer at Aberdeen Proven Ground. Jacqueline was described by her peers and loved ones as a strong, intelligent, kind, genuine, helpful, and caring person. Sadly, Jacqueline Smith's life was taken after being stabbed in the chest early Saturday morning on December 1st, 2018. Police had said there in their initial report that Jacqueline Smith and her family were driving their 2012 Audi A7 through the 1000 block of Valley Street in the Johnson Square neighborhood at 12.27 a.m when they saw a young woman carrying what looked like a baby wrapped in a blanket and holding a cardboard sign that read, please help me feed my baby. Jacqueline, who was in the front passenger seat of the car, allegedly told her husband Keith to roll the window down to give this woman and her baby money. Jacqueline started to hand over a $10 bill Suddenly, a man approached the vehicle, appearing to thank the woman, before he lunged into the car and tried to grab Jacqueline's wallet. According to initial police reports, after the struggle, the man took out a knife and hit Jacqueline up. The man and the woman who were taught to be responsible fled the scene. Jacqueline was rushed to nearby Johns Hopkins Hospital with stab wounds where she later died. According to court documents, Jacqueline was hit up five times in the chest and once in the lower right arm. 
hours prior on Friday night, Jacqueline and her husband Keith Smith, 52, originally from Baltimore, went out dancing at the American Legion on Madison Street in Baltimore, where the couple danced to their wedding song, John Legend's All of Me. The couple also brought along Keith's daughter and Jacqueline's stepdaughter, Siobhan, aka Valerie Smith, who lived on Valley Street in East Baltimore, along to celebrate her 28th birthday. Jacqueline's husband had been the one to call 911 after his wife's fatal encounter with the alleged panhandlers. He was the one that told police that Jacqueline had been stabbed by a man through their roll down window after giving money to a woman panhandling in the rain in East Baltimore. Keith Smith said that his wife's necklace and pocketbook was snatched by the panhandlers. He also alleged that the suspects ran away, but the woman paused long enough to say something Keith said. He said, this girl actually said, God bless you, after his wife was attacked by the man. The following Monday, police officials canvassed the Johnson Square neighborhood near East Chase and Valley Street in East Baltimore to locate the possible suspects or any potential evidence. At the time, detectives had no leads on the pair's identity. The city was outraged with emotions. Many couldn't believe a woman would be killed for her generosity. She was helping a homeless woman and her baby. How could that have turned into her being fatally attacked? Baltimore already had a stigma of violent crime, so it just added fuel to the negative connotations of the city. The mayor at the time, Catherine Pugh, had even spoken with Jacqueline's husband. The mayor at the time said the incident was unconscionable. Police officials actually believed that these alleged suspects at the time were using panhandling as a way to lure their would-be victims. They even cautioned the public about engaging with panhandlers, claiming not all of them had honest intent or were not really in need. This caused a ripple-down effect and many in the city became reluctant and stopped giving to the homeless. The homeless community had been painted in a bad light and many who were really in need because of their circumstances took the brunt of the negative outcomes. Keith Smith alleged that he felt reluctant to give that night, but his wife held the money out because she felt moved to give the woman some money, he said. He even wanted to get a law passed in his wife's memory banning panhandling throughout Baltimore City. He said that the Monday after his wife's death that something needs to be done because now you don't know whether or not you're going to give and the person's going to take your life or are they going to say thank you. He went on to say that there are some desperate people. They don't need help. They're trying to hurt you. Keith Smith said on the news that he was a minister, man of God, and he tries to help people. The couple's local church, where they attended for almost four years, stepped in right away to comfort the distraught husband. Jacqueline and Keith were a part of the church's help in hand ministry and thought Christian education classes to new members. The congregation, the pastor and his wife were saddened by the loss of their beloved church member. Jacqueline was known to be generous motivating and always willing to lend a helping hand at church. Keith's daughter and Jacqueline's stepdaughter, Siobhan aka Valeria Smith, was also present in the car when Jacqueline was attacked by the supposed panhandlers. She was sitting in the back seat of the car when the incident took place. She was by her father's side the entire time he did interviews with local news stations. They both expressed their grief and pain that they felt at the sudden loss of Jacqueline. Jacqueline Smith's mother, Anna, was notified of her daughter's tragic death by her then son-in-law, Keith Smith, on the day of the horrific incident. 
Jacqueline's mother wanted her daughter to be remembered for all of her accomplishments and not just her tragic death. She gushed over her daughter's intelligence, interests, and motherhood. Jacqueline's older brother, Marcel, was also shocked by the news. He resided in Hartford County along with his sister. Everyone in the family was traumatized over their loss of Jacqueline. Jacqueline's older sister, Yvonne, who lived in New Jersey, said that although the family was scattered, they remained close, and she was always traveling for holidays, graduations, and trips together. She described her sister as a successful, independent woman, and despite her success, her baby sister was not boastful and was very unpretentious. She was very caring and always willing to give to others in need. Jacqueline and her sister had spoken two days before her death. They were supposed to travel to California with family to Jacqueline's son's graduation ceremony from an IT program with the U.S. Coast Guard, but instead, they now had to plan her funeral. As days went on after the horrific crime, Keith's tearful appearances on local TV news continued to make headlines and garnered attention from national news sources, especially after one-time Baltimore resident, Oprah Winfrey, elevated the story by tweeting about the incident saying, this story struck my heart. I've done this a thousand times, but will think twice before ever doing it again. To JS family, I hope her death gets people quote unquote woke to change. Again, this amount of attention shook Baltimore City's already fragile reputation to the cure. The media attention prompted questions from the public to politicians and law enforcement leaders to do something about the city's homeless crisis. A candlelight visual was held for Jacqueline in East Baltimore by community members who desperately desired for the violence to stop. Although Jacqueline's family arranged to have her homegoing service in Providence, Rhode Island, where most of her family resided, a public service honoring Jacqueline's life was held at the Help and Hands Ministry where she and her husband attended in Churchville, Maryland. Many gathers at speaker after speaker spoke on Jacqueline's giving nature and infectious personality. Friends and co-workers embraced and hugged Keith Smith, who at the end of the service rose and thanked everyone for their support. And he spoke of his wife. He talked about the first time they met on October 5th, 2013, at a birthday party of a mutual friend. He said he was nervous about asking her to dance, but it was the love at first sight, he said. He went on to say, I like to say we danced our way to the altar. He proposed to Jacqueline on Christmas Eve of that year. He went on to say, me and my wife, we became one. We became one in everything. That's what happens when you find your soulmate. That was my everything. One day I'll find peace within myself. Right now, I'm just healing. Still, I'm going to honor my wife's memory and make sure my wife did not die in vain, he said. However, the national media attention proved to maybe be too much for Keith Smith. Within weeks after his wife's death, he suddenly stopped all interviews and contact with the media. It seemed odd because he was so open to speaking to local media right after what happened to his wife. As Jacqueline's family from Rhode Island mourned their loss, they still had to process that her killer was still on the loose. Police had not made any arrests yet and had no solid leads up until that point, except when workers at a small corner store in the area of Greenmount Avenue and East Chase Street said that police took surveillance video from their cameras looking for footage of the panhandlers the night Jacqueline was killed. Investigators were asking anyone with information to contact them or Metro Crime Stoppers. 
Months went by with no update. Then, in March 2019, police announced that the case that drew national attention, the story of Jacqueline's death given by her husband and stepdaughter about her being fatally stabbed giving money to a panhandler, was actually staged and a ruse to cover up their alleged involvement. They were charged with her death. They were subsequently arrested by Texas State Police near the U.S.-Mexico border while trying to flee the country in a rental car, leaving a parking lot at a small grocery store in Combs, Texas. Warrants charging them with first-degree murder in the death of Jacqueline were issued. According to police, the information and evidence points to it wasn't a panhandler. Several members of Jacqueline Smith's family said they always doubted Keith's story from the beginning. Jacqueline's brother said he already knew it was Keith. He said it never made sense. Her mother also said that she was surprised by her daughter's supposed actions that night. She knows her daughter to be more cautious, although she was willing to help others. Even neighbors in the Johnson Square neighborhood said that Keith Smith's story raised suspicions because the block he claimed the incident happened was usually empty by that time and none of the neighbors had ever seen such a woman with a baby. The information was all messed up, so people were finding it hard to straighten out the story. With the arrest, it was clear that Keith Smith and his daughter were willing to exploit the city, its violence, and the legitimate fears of the residents of Baltimore to cover up their alleged role in Jacqueline's death, according to law enforcement and city officials. Jacqueline's brother said that Keith Smith had moved out of his sister's Aberdeen house two weeks prior to his arrest. Keith allegedly handed the keys over to Jacqueline's brother and told the family and friends that he was moving to Florida. He even allegedly sent a photo of himself surrounded by palm trees to his pastor who had been there for him at his time of need at his wife's passing. Jacqueline's brother said Keith had removed all appliances from the house his sister owned. Many across Baltimore, the state of Maryland, and across the country were shocked by the news of Keith and his daughter's arrests. Many believe Keith and sympathize with him after his wife's death, a good Samaritan who lost her life for charitable deed, had now turned into a twisted story to cover up a murder scheme, allegedly. Those who offered Keith Smith their condolences personally to his face were appalled at his arrest. They called it tragic, senseless, monstrous, and shocking. As the news of Keith Smith's involvement spread, crimes of his past were brought up. Decades before, he allegedly robbed a Timonium bank three times. According to police records, he grew desperate because he had lost his job. He was raising his daughter alone, and he found out he had health issues. According to police, he stated that his bills were past due, so he needed the money. He was sentenced to 12 years and was paroled in 2007. Now, he was back in police custody along with his daughter, awaiting extradition to stand trial for allegedly killing his second wife. Jacqueline's son asked the court to strip the control of her estate from her husband, Keith Smith, after his arrest. They said he also lied on forms to control their mother's estate, allegedly. Family members state that Jacqueline was 100% the breadwinner of the couple. According to Jacqueline's brother, she had always been cautious with her money all her life, up until she married Keith Smith. Then she became indulgent, according to her brother. She traded up to a Mercedes-Benz, and the couple had purchased an Audi for Keith and a 50-foot yacht. 
It was said that Keith, a truck driver, benefited financially from Jacqueline during her life. Her brother believed Keith had pushed a lavish lifestyle on his sister. According to charging documents, a friend of Keith Smith told the police that he had allegedly asked for help to quote unquote get rid of his wife after she asked him for a divorce. It was through Keith's brother that he had been asked allegedly. Detectives documented that Keith and his daughter gave inconsistent accounts of the crime in different interviews, triggering the officer's suspicions. Also, according to court documents, footage from the surveillance cameras showed no sign of their car in the empty stretch of East Baltimore. The police also wiretapped Keith and Valeria's cell phones. They tracked their Google search history and used their location to show their inconsistencies. There was also evidence of cell phone signals placing the Smiths in Jewett Hill Park for 15 unexplained minutes that night, according to detectives. On February 27th, Keith's brother was served a subpoena to testify before a grand jury. After being warned by his brother the following day, that's when Keith allegedly began making getaway plans. All the evidence the police had on the father and daughter were circumstantial. Once Keith and his daughter returned to Baltimore, they were denied bail because of their alleged attempt to flee the country. A month later, in April 2019, a judge stripped Keith of his authority over his wife's estate. In June 2019, his daughter Valeria Smith's charge was reduced to being an accessory after the crime. Valeria pleaded guilty to the charge on September 26, 2019, admitting to watching Jacqueline's murder, concocting the panhandler story, and helping her father try to escape to Mexico. She was expected to be sentenced in January 2020. It's unclear if her sentencing occurred or if it was moved. Because of her father's impending trial, her plea agreement was kept under seal. She may have to testify against her father if she hasn't already been sentenced. She could face up to 10 years in prison on the accessory charge. Keith Smith's trial was originally scheduled to begin 10 days after his daughter pleaded guilty, but it was postponed to February 2020 because his defense needed more time. In January 2020, it was reported that his trial was scheduled for April 2020. Because of the pandemic last year, his trial had been postponed again. While a trial date has not been set, Keith Smith will appear in court December 1st of this year, three years to the day after his wife was killed. All right, fam, that's it for this lengthy, crazy story. I know it was a lot. Thank you all so much who made it to the end. My sincerest and deepest condolences to Jacqueline's family. She seemed like a lovely lady who did not deserve this tragic end to her life. Please keep the discussion going in the comments section below. Tell me what you think about this alleged scheme. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe. This is your girl, Mrs. Tony Two Times, and I'm out.